It's good to see you all, and it's uh, good to be here for the meeting. It's a pleasure, as you said, in person would be even a greater pleasure, and it will hopefully start soon again, but, but not quite yet. So I just have a few things to say. So I think many of you are familiar with ECT STAR, um, but for those who are not, let me just say a, a few things. Um, let's see here. So ECT STAR has been around since 1993, so quite a long time now. And uh, its basic purposes are, are put out on this slide here. So to do research in theoretical nuclear physics, uh, to promote contact between theory and experiment, and also to related areas of research and to train uh, young researchers. And um, I'll say a few more things about, about these in, in a minute. And what's very important, of course, it's a, it's a bottom-up uh, 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 approach. So the participants, uh, researchers in the field propose ex um, workshops, training programs, and so on. Um, and then um, ECT STAR is happy to, uh, to deliver these and plan the program. And these are the activities of 2021. It's a bit small, but the, on the website is a bigger poster. So all activities are online, as you know, and we're currently working on having hybrid meetings starting from the end of September. So that will be quite exciting. Uh, you know, a limited number of people in the lecture theater and other people joining in on, on Zoom. Um, so we hope we can, we can make it happen. And then concerning the training program, um, the typical, typically two, there's the doctoral training program, um, which is running now. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, Zora was lecturing there. She's, went to the, oh, she's on the second screen. She was lecturing in the school uh, two weeks ago or so. And the talent school on machine learning has started to, or will start today. So both of these programs are currently uh, running. Uh, online, obviously. And then there will, it's also a visitor program, which is currently uh, not running, but we hope to start it again in 2022 when things return to a normal occupancy. Um, okay, we have a Twitter account. Um, we only joined Twitter recently. Um, so the number of followers is, is going up steadily. So please, you know, join and follow. I'm not a Twitter, a tweeter myself, but um, some people are. Um, a little bit about related areas. As you know, this is, is very broad. It's uh, astrophysics, cosmology, particle physics, also condensed matter physics, ultra cold atomic gases, computational physics, um, and also quantum technology and quantum computing. Um, and this is, of course, an interesting topic. And also, there seems to be more and more overlap with nuclear physics in terms of, say, the quantum uh, many body problem, or uh, in general, solving strongly coupled systems or, or real time dynamics. And so there's a lot of opportunities here for the theoretical nuclear physics community. So this is just a, a uh, for your information, really. Um, so the program at uh, ECT STAR is uh, put together and approved by the scientific board. So current membership of the board is, uh, is given here. Um, people typically serve on the board for three years and they are suggested by ECT STAR associates. And everyone who participates in a workshop becomes an associate. So it's a quite easy mechanism. Um, and so whenever a call comes out, uh, please you know, suggest people who would be useful to serve on the, on the board. As a, because it's for three years, there's a almost semi-continuous change of, of membership of the board. Uh, a few things about funding then. So funding is coming locally from the Bruno Kessler Foundation. Um, and then there's funding from national funding agencies and uh, also Horizon 2020 or Horizon funding for the future. And what's kind of interesting here is that ECT STAR is recognized as what's called a transnational access facility by NUPEC. Um, and so all the other transnational access facilities are labs, experimental labs. So ECT STAR is kind of the theoretical lab um, to use. So that's something to, to keep in mind as well. And yeah, logos of the agencies, so these are all the national ones like INFN and CNRS and so on. Um, and EU funding and uh, another few uh, participants in, in Germany that fund. Um, this funding is, of course, extremely important to keep ECT STAR uh, running. Um, this workshop is an EMI workshop. So EMI is the, the Theory Institute that based at GSI in Darmstadt. And, um, and so if you uh, do any work at this workshop that is you know, either initiated here or developed or completed, 
uh, if you could please use this uh, this citation in the acknowledgments. I will send this to uh, Susan as well, so she can share it uh, with you. Um, I think that's it. Just for those of you who haven't been to ECT Star in Trento, this you you could have been here um, if uh, things would be different. But of course, we're looking forward to welcoming you all in the uh, in the future when it's uh, hopefully possible again. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Mark Alford will uh, speak next if he can share yep. his screen. Excellent. Okay, then. All right, how is that looking? Everything okay? All right. So yeah, it's it's a tremendous honor to uh, to be invited, uh, even if if I don't get to be in the beautiful building uh, to talk at this uh, this this very interesting ECT star workshop. So um, I'm going to talk about neutron star mergers as material science, and this is based on a whole bunch of papers. And there's even a, a YouTube video for the outreach to the general public and I have a much simpler set of funding logos here, um, so but that's mine. Okay, let's. So the outline, which I will get through in 25 minutes as commanded, is um, I'm going to just give you a sense of neutron star mergers as a probe of dense matter. That's what I meant by by material science, and the idea is that different phases of dense matter, even if they have similar equations of state may be distinguishable by their transport properties. And I'll talk about a couple of examples. I'll talk a little bit about thermal conductivity. So is the, do, do temperature inhomogeneities smooth themselves out through thermal conduction fast enough that you could see that in a merger and thereby use the merger to probe the thermal conductivity? And then I'll ask the same question for bulk viscosity. Um, is the damping time for density oscillations fast enough to affect the merger so that uh, data obtained from mergers, such as gravitational wave signals or electromagnetic counterparts, could tell you something about the bulk viscosity um, and thereby the transport properties of the material and thereby maybe which phases are present. So that's the overall plan here. Um, okay, so let's start with uh, the, the over, overview. Here is this phase diagram that, that those of us who do nuclear um, physics, nuclear astrophysics, and uh, high energy collisions are interested in. So you've got uh, chemical potential uh, pushing the density of baryons up along the bottom, you've got temperature going up here, and you've got different parts of this phase diagram probed by different, uh, for different experiments. So neutron stars are cold, and they have neutron nuclear matter in them that's uh, superfluid and so forth, and in the middle we're not quite sure what. Uh, you've got heavy ion colliders up here looking at the high temperature region, seeing the quark-gluon plasma. Um, the hadronic phase we all know quite well. Uh, and neutron star mergers are very interesting because they probe this sort of warm, dense region. And if I now switch to showing you our conjecture about the phase diagram, um, we, we think there's a critical point up here, and we think there's a, a, a quark Cooper paired phase, the color Flavelock phase, up at very high density. Um, but mergers are in a place where we really don't know too well what's going on. And there's various proposals, there's lots of ideas about a complex phase structure here. And that's what makes it particularly interesting to use them uh, as a way of understanding what's in there, you know, what's in there for real. So that's the idea. Neutron star mergers telling us about the dynamics, they're quick. So they're telling us about what happens <clears throat> on a 20 millisecond time scale in this region of the phase diagram. All right. So um, as I just said, they probe the properties of nuclear or possibly even quark matter that's created at this high density and reasonably high temperature range. This is a snapshot from a, um, a, a, a simulation uh, from the Vazola group in Frankfurt. Uh, and it, it just shows you that the density gets high, it gets well above nuclear density, and it shows you there's all sorts of stuff going on. Now, in order to do these simulations, you need to know the properties of the material. Now, the purpose of the simulation ultimately is to be compared that the, the predictions of this simulation, it'll predict gravitational wave signals and electromagnetic counterparts and so on. So this uh, simulation, these sort of simulations are the connection between 
the, um, the properties of the material and the astrophysics, and we have to put in the right material properties. So which material properties are relevant? What do the simulators need to know? Well, they need to know the equation of state. Obviously, they need to know the density as a function of the pressure. But maybe they need to know other things. And that's, as you already know, is going to be my point. So here's another way of looking at how nuclear material looks in a neutron star merger. This is uh, density in units of the density of a nucleus. And this is temperature in units of MeV. And this is showing two snapshots at two milliseconds after the merger and 10 milliseconds after the merger of what range of temperatures and densities is being probed in the, ooh, let me just, should I stop my video? My video is just frozen. Um, yeah, let me do that. Can you still hear me okay? Alex, do you want to? Yes, yes, okay. yes absolutely. I'll stop my video and then I'll just carry on with this. Um, so this is showing you, so this shows you two milliseconds after the merger, there's parts of the star of the two merging stars that are at twice saturation density and 20 MeV temperatures, and there's parts going up to 60 MeV. And a little bit later, it's, it's settled into this sort of shape where the densest parts are warmish, uh, 10 MeV, the less dense parts are warmish, but the middle, middle density parts are hotter. So my point here is not anything very detailed, it's just that we see that there's significant spatial and temporal variation in the temperature. The temperature is different in different places and at different times. The fluid flow velocity is changing and the density is changing over time. And if you have this spatial and temporal variation in these things, that leads you to think, oh, we're going to need to allow at least the possibility that spatial variations in temperature lead to thermal conduction. So we need to know the thermal conductivity Spatial variations in fluid flow velocity may mean that there's shear viscous damping going on, so we need to know the shear viscosity. And uh, variation in density over time uh, means that we need to know the bulk viscosity. So the question I'm going to address in this talk is, are these transport properties actually important? Can we guess? Can we estimate? So here's the sum, here's the here's the answer, right? Because you know you need to know the answer before you, before you uh, listen to the rest of the talk. Uh, so the, the thing to bear in mind is we they, they're only important if they can do something in 20 milliseconds, because 20 milliseconds is roughly how long it takes for the two neutron stars to go from being two objects to being one object. And after 20 milliseconds, most of the interesting swirling and surging and and squeezing is over, and it's pretty much a spherical object that's settling down. So if in 20 milliseconds, these things can affect the dynamics, then they're important. If they take longer than that, the simulation people can ignore them perfectly safely. So the executive summary is this. Thermal conductivity may operate that fast if neutrinos are trapped and there are short distance temperature gradients. And I'll show you, I'll flesh that out a little bit in the rest of the talk. Shear viscosity is a pretty similar conclusion. Bulk viscosity, um, there are indications uh, that it could damp density oscillations quite quickly on the sort of 20 millisecond time scale of the merger. So there is some good reason to try including bulk viscosity in merger simulations. All right, so let me go through these and say a little bit more about them. Let me first talk about thermal equilibration. I'm just gonna sketch for you how we got that estimate. Okay, not gonna go into details, but sketch for you how, how, we, how we got that general sense. So you look at a hot spot, right? So you say, here's distance, here's temperature. Imagine there's a hot spot with some typical size, Z typical, that's about the, the size of the hot spot, and it's about the size of the boundary region where the <clears throat> hot spot goes from hot to normal temperature around it. And so it's got a volume Z cubed, it's got a surface area, let's pretend it's a cube, we're doing things very roughly here. So <clears throat> it's about six times Z squared, and the equilibration time is pretty simple. It's how much extra heat is there stored in that region divided by what's the rate at which heat is flowing out of that region. Okay, you take how much you have and divide by how quickly you're losing it, and you find out how long does it take for heat to move from one place to another. And again, in the merger, the merger is pretty much over. Uh, the, the sort of dynamically interesting part of the merger um, is pretty much over after about 20 milliseconds. So we're going to be interested in thermal conduction if it can move some heat around the place within about 20 milliseconds. All right, so 
we can estimate those things quite easily. The extra heat in the region is the uh, heat capacity times the volume times how much hotter it is than its surroundings. So heat capacity, volume, uh, extra temperature. The rate of heat outflow is the thermal conductivity times the temperature gradient times the surface area. And the temperature gradient in that is roughly the extra temperature divided by the size, right? You go back here and you see this temperature gradient is roughly how much hotter divided by how big was the thing. So you can estimate that, and then you can divide them, the time to equilibrate, extra temperature divided by rate of heat outflow, various things cancel, and you find that it goes like the specific heat. Um, that makes sense, right? More specific heat means more heat stored, so it takes longer for it to leak away. Uh, Z squared, that's because of, um, it, as, the, uh, as the hot spot is, it gets bigger, the temperature gradient gets more gradual, and the amount of heat stored gets bigger, faster than the surface area, so bigger ones take longer to smooth out. And the thermal conduction is on the bottom if the thermal conduction is very fast that the equilibration time will be short so basically we just need to look at our matter our best guess simplest guess is it's just nuclear matter uh, neutrons protons and electrons and we estimate the heat capacity maybe our heat capacity we estimate the thermal conductivity and that'll tell us is thermal conductivity thermal conduction a significant factor in those 20 milliseconds of the two stars merging into one star so I'm not going to do this in detail. I'm just going to sketch it. Um, it's we're doing condensed matter physics, kind of, but with a different set of particles. So we've got neutrons, a lot of them. Nuclear matter is 90% neutrons with a Fermi surface filled up and a little bit of thermal blurring at the Fermi surface. We've got protons and electrons, equal numbers to be electrically neutral, um, but there's fewer of them. And then if the temperature is hot enough, neutrinos are trapped and we've got a little Fermi surface of neutrinos as well. So this is the sort of uh, cast of characters that somehow they are going to combine to give you a heat capacity and thermal conductivity. Well, let's look at the heat capacity. Not gonna go through this in detail, but it's basically the number of states available to carry energy of order the temperature and it's pretty obvious here, this is going to be dominated by the neutrons. It's the neutrons that have this big Fermi surface with lots of states that could be excited by a small amount of energy. So you go through a little estimate and you find out that the specific heat is basically goes like the density of neutrons to some power and the temperature, right? It goes like the temperature because the temperature tells you the thickness of this region where you've got uh, states that can be given a bit of energy. So there you are. Okay, you've, got, you've estimated the specific heat. Good. One down, one to go. So the thermal conductivity, well, we can look at this in a classic condensed matter kinetic theory kind of way. And we say the thermal conductivity goes like the density of the particles doing it times their speed times their mean free path. So you can see this is going to be dominated by whichever species has the right combination of high density. So there's lots of them and you want weak interactions. So they've got a nice long mean free path and they can carry energy from one place to another. Well, who, let, let's look at our, our uh, cast, cast of characters here. The neutrons are not a good bet. There, there's lots of them, but they're strongly interacting through the nuclear force. So they've got a short mean free path. The protons are useless, low density and strongly interacting. So they're not gonna help you. The electrons look decent. They're low density, but they only have electromagnetic interactions. So they have a long mean free path. So they could be a good contributor to this. But the real heroes in this case, at least potentially are the neutrinos. If the temperature is too low, <clears throat> their mean free path is so big that they escape from the star and then they don't, they're not there. So they don't, they don't help you. They could do radiative energy loss and it would be interesting to look at that, but they're not gonna do thermal conduction. But if, if you're in a slightly hotter regime, the temperature above about five MeV, their mean free path is very long, long enough for there to be a trapped population, uh, so short enough for there to be a trapped population in the star, but long enough for them to move stuff around. So the really hopeful regime for thermal conductivity to be big and thereby make an impact on the merger is if you're above 5 MeV and then you look at the neutrinos as the ones doing the thermal conduction. So you can work this out, right? We said the equilibration time is basically the thermal, the uh, heat capacity divided by the thermal conductivity. You can calculate the thermal conductivity, you just look it up in the literature, um, due to neutrinos scattering off electrons. Um, and here's the, cal the calculation, the, the, the estimate from the literature. You see the coupling is on the bottom because uh, the weaker the interaction, the better. You plug this all in and you find that the time it takes for a hotspot 
to smooth out is prefactor of 700 milliseconds and then the typical um, size of your hotspot in units of a kilometer, temperature in units of 10 MeV, and then a whole bunch of other things that we think we roughly know what they should be. So what this tells you then, you look at this and you say, well, when is this time scale going to get down to 20 milliseconds so it could impact the merger? And the answer is, well, you need to have small hotspots, maybe 100 meters across, and the temperature in the sort of 10 MeV range so the neutrinos are trapped. And then you could possibly get thermal conduction playing a role in the merger. OK, well, I see I'm, uh, I'm pushing up uh, against my time limit here, but I'll say a little bit about the next thing, which is bulk viscosity. Um, so this is density oscillations. We're going to do just a very similar thing with density oscillations. This is equivalent to sound attenuation, basically. It's how, how quickly does a density oscillation get damped? Well, the first question would be, are there density oscillations? And the answer is yes. Here's some fluid elements uh, being tracked in a merger simulation. And you see in the first five or 10 milliseconds, their density fluctuates quite wildly. They're being dragged down into the deeper parts of the star and then popped back up to the surface. And so they've got a lot of density oscillations going on with a period of about one kilohertz, right? Millisecond, sorry, a frequency of about a kilohertz, period of a few milliseconds. So again, we're going to ask the same question as before. How long does it take for bulk viscosity to dissipate a decent fraction of the energy of a density oscillation? What's the damping time due to bulk viscosity? And can you get it to be less than about 20 milliseconds? so that bulk viscosity would affect these density oscillations. This simulation obviously didn't include them. So you just look at the density oscillation of some amplitude delta n um, with some frequency, and you say, okay, the damping time is the energy stored in the oscillation divided by the rate at which you're losing energy. And can we get that to be small enough? And you estimate these things. So What's the dense energy of a density oscillation? It goes, it's basically a harmonic oscillator, right? The nuclear incompressibility, the how, how easy is it to squeeze nuclear matter? That's like the spring constant. These factors are just really to do with the conventional normalization of this quantity. And it goes like the amplitude squared. That's the energy stored in this density oscillation. And the rate at which it gets dissipated, that comes from the bulk viscosity, which is this uh, zeta here. And again, there's some factors like the frequency that really arise from the definition of the bulk viscosity. And again, it goes like the amplitude squared. This is a linear, linear response theory, obviously. So the damping time is how much you have divided by how quickly it leaks away. Um, and it ends up being, roughly speaking, the incompressibility of nuclear matter divided by the bulk viscosity. So you need to calculate these things. So you get the nuclear incompressibility from the equation of state, and you get the bulk viscosity from beta equilibration of the proton fraction. So let me just say a quick word about that. Uh, again, it's the weak interaction, interestingly, that's playing the dominant role, just like it did with thermal conductivity, where the neutrinos ended up being the dominant players. Here, it's the weak interaction, again, that's gonna be the dominant player, this time through the re-equilibration of the proton fraction. So what's happening is, in this density oscillation, uh, you compress your nuclear matter and the proton fraction wants to change. The pro proton fraction at higher density is different from the proton fraction, the equilibrium proton fraction at lower density. So when you compress it, it starts trying to turn neutrons into protons and electrons or protons and electrons into neutrons. But the only process that can do this is the weak interaction, which is rather slow. And that's fortunate because these, depending on which regime you're in, slightly different processes, but basically weak interaction processes because they're slow, they don't happen on the typical nuclear physics time scale, which is 10 to the minus 23 of a second. They happen on a much slower time scale, which can be milliseconds. And that's important because if you go back, the frequency of these oscillations was milliseconds. And bulk viscosity is biggest when the time scale on which the system is trying to re-equilibrate is similar to the time scale of the density oscillation itself. And um, that's because it's basically a phase lag. So I'm not gonna go through this slide um, in full detail, but um, the idea is that some property of the material takes time to equilibrate. So when you compress and uncompress again in a density oscillation, the density, in other words, the volume of the fluid element is out of phase with the applied pressure. And that's because of this delay in equilibration, internal equilibration. 
And if the pressure and the volume are out of phase with each other, you can get this little loop here in pressure volume space and you do some work, which is the area of this loop. And that's the dissipated energy in one cycle. That's the, 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 the loss of compression energy getting turned into some other form of energy, such as heat or neutrino emission. And this is going to be most effective, there's going to be biggest uh, dissipation is going to happen when the time scale of the internal re-equilibration of this proton fraction in our case is similar to the one kilohertz, one millisecond uh, time scale of the oscillations that are externally imposed. So you, uh, you do your calculation and you calculate the damping time results and they're a little more complicated than with uh, thermal conductivity. So I'm showing them here as a plot in terms of the density along this axis in units of nuclear density and the temperature up the side in MeV. This is for a particular equation of state for an oscillation frequency one kilohertz. And what's the damping time? Well, if the density is very high, it takes a long time because there's a lot of energy stored. The nuclear, the nuclear incompressibility gets very big at high density. There's a lot of energy stored in the oscillation. It takes a long time to get rid of it. Mark, but you can see, sorry. yes. Sorry to interrupt, just five minutes left. Okay, good, perfect, perfect. Um, but you can see in here that there's a region around a temperature of three MeV or so, um, and at moderate densities of maybe one or two or three times nuclear density, there's this region here where the um, bulk viscous damping time, the attenuation time for density oscillations, is in the interesting range. It's just getting down to about maybe 25 milliseconds here. Again, this is for one particular equation of state. Other equations of state will give you a slightly different um, plot here, but not, not hugely different. So there is some uh, hope here that in mergers, you could have bulk viscosity acting on the time scale of the merger, the 20 MeV time scale, and damping your density oscillations that are going on during that very chaotic um, swirling and crunching of the two stars um, colliding and merging. Also down here, there's a little bit of, uh, of um, short uh, uh, equilibration, sh uh, short uh, bulk viscous damping time as well. So it looks sort of hopeful. Uh, and it, it makes it makes you think maybe it's worthwhile pursuing bulk viscosity as a transport property that we should uh, get get an idea of it and feed it to the into the merger simulations. So um, let me uh, sort of wrap up here. Um, so our conclusion based on these um, these first estimates is that some forms of dissipation are probably playing a role in neutron star mergers. The equation of state is important, but it's not just the equation of state. There does seem to be some prospect that transport properties could influence the merger and thereby uh, the merger could become a probe of those transport properties in nuclear matter. Um, and one that I mentioned was thermal conductivity. Shear viscosity is similar. Um, looks like in the neutrino trapped regime, where neutrinos are trapped in the merger region, um, and if there are reasonably fine scale gradients, which it actually does appear there are based on the merger simulations as they get their uh, resolution to shorter and shorter distance scales, they are seeing structure on these distance, shorter and shorter distance scales. So there may be fine scale structure. Um, and in that case, thermal conductivity could play a role. And bulk viscosity, um, as we just uh, saw in that very quick overview, it does seem to have the ability in nuclear matter to damp density oscillations, this time in the neutrino transparent regime, so at lower temperatures, it seems to peak at 3 MeV. Um, and so it looks again like there's some decent chance that uh, bulk viscosity could influence the merger. So the prospects of the future are what do we want to do? One would be include bulk viscosity in merger simulations, and people are working on doing that right now. And the other thing would be I showed you the bulk viscosity for the most generic sort of vanilla nuclear matter, um, just protons, neutrons, and electrons. But there are other forms of matter. I've already, my postdoc um, did a calculation recently for hyperonic matter, matter with not just neutrons and protons, but also lambdas or possibly sigma um, um, baryons in there. Um, you could look at muonic um, matter where there's muons as well as electrons. You can look at other interesting phases, pion condensed nuclear pasta, for those of you who know what that is. Uh, quark matter, which you could get if uh, if there's a phase transition to uh, to a form of quark matter instead of nuclear matter. 
And the final thing I want to mention is you can actually even think about some beyond the standard model physics. So here I cheated and I have one more slide. Um, this was something done by my uh, student, Stephen Harris, and they looked at axions or axion-like particles um, being uh, cooling a hot region by radiative emission. And this is the axion coupling up here. Here's the limit from supernova 1987A, so people think it should be below this line here. Here's the temperature of the hot region. And they found that um, if it gets really hot, which it does seem like it can get to 100 MeV in mergers, there's just about the possibility that axion, if there's an axion with this coupling, radiation of those axions could uh, significantly, um, could cool the, that region quickly enough to be um, in the 10 millisecond time scale to be noticeable in the merger. So there's even the prospect of probing a little beyond the standard model physics with this. Okay, and there I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm sorry there's no clapping, but I'll take it personally. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for this uh, nice overview. Um, do we have some time for questions, everyone? So you know what this means. If you don't ask questions, I will ask a question, but I will pause. Can I ask a question? Please. So that was very nice. And I, I wonder, so there were some recent papers uh, by Horowitz and co-workers pointing out that the surface of a neutron star is one of the stiffest materials around. So that would say maybe you have even access to much smaller time scales, though not in the bulk, but rather at the surface. How, how does this uh, uh, play in, into what you presented? Um, so the, so I, okay, I think in the merger, the surface gets broken up pretty quickly. Right, because when those stars collide, if I, maybe I should, well, maybe you can remember, we were seeing temperatures, it was pretty quickly getting to temperatures of 10 MeV or so. And I think that's going to destroy the crust. Okay, so the crust is probably more important during the in spiral, right? When the, they haven't touched yet. That's a period when it's interesting to look at sort of flexing, tidal flexing of the crust. And I, I, what I was talking about was physics of the nuclear matter liquid, right? I was talking about just a Fermi liquid. You're talking about a solid crust phase. And I think there's very, there's lots of room to look at that um, in the in-spiral. Uh, another very interesting direction that I just didn't touch on. Thank you. Can, can I ask you just a quick question? I, I know I'm one of the organizers, but if... Um... I, I can wait until people ask. No, no, please go ahead, Carlos. Yeah. Uh, Mark, I, ha I have, I have two, 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 two quick questions. Uh, one of them is, uh, 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 you know, there's always this interesting work uh, about neutron stars in which they talk about uh, super, super connectivity, super fluidity. Uh, how, how would that play uh, on, on, on this question of a problem? Can you, can you try to do something also that, uh, that can reveal some of these properties? Are they important in the mergers uh, as, as a result of the things? And the second one, just to do quickly, is about the axions. Uh, if, if axions are indeed uh, a possibility uh, of being emitted, how, how uh, uh, you think you, you expect them to, to detect them here on Earth? Uh, okay. Along the way, uh, there'll be lots of stuff that can happen. Okay, let me, let me answer, okay, I'm happy to answer this. Let me answer the second question first. So the idea would be not that you'd see the axions, the idea would be the axions would cool, would lead to a sort of anomalous cooling and that would affect the evolution of the merger. So you oh. wouldn't see them directly, you'd see, oh, it, it would be just like with supernovas, you know, where supernovas put limits on axions by saying, oh, wow, if there were axions, you know, taking away heat, the thing wouldn't go at all. Okay, I right. got it. So, so it's, it's the same idea. Yeah. I understand. Yeah, okay. So for your first question, um, let me just quickly go back uh, and um, uh, to the to, to my earlier, oh, can you, actually, am I sharing, wait a minute, am I sharing? Can you see that my screen or not? Yeah, we can. We can also see your terminal. Okay, let me just, um, let me just try sharing again. Um, here we go. I don't want the desktop, I want the, there we go. That's what I wanted to share. Okay. Um, so if I go back to my, the early slides where I was just talking about the conditions in the merger, um, so the, the, the critical temperature for superfluidity in nuclear matter is no, probably no more than one MeV, okay? So as soon as you get into the merger, you're, you're, you, you've melted any kind of 
superfluid neutron condensate. Mm -hmm. um, but quark matter, the color superconductivity, people guess uh, or estimate if you want to be, be sort of charitable that the, um, the critical temperature for quark Cooper pairing could be tens or 100 MeV. So it's possible when we get to quark matter at this point, we're still sort of, you know, working out the, if you like, the, the null hypothesis of regular nuclear matter, what would its transport properties be? But once you get to studying quark matter, indeed, at 20 or 30 MeV, you could possibly have um, Cooper paired superfluid quark matter surviving under those hot conditions. And it would be very interesting to see how its behavior was different from the behavior of the nuclear matter I was describing here. Okay, so 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 in the same density range, uh, just a higher uh, uh, increased temperature at higher right because we don't right because we just don't know where quark matter begins. You know, maybe right, exactly. at or three times nuclear density. So that's just sure. a, a an area to study. You know? Yeah, you, you leave you leave the possibility open. I understand exactly. Right. Thank you. Excellent. So I think uh, that uh, let's thank Mark again, uh, mentally or silently, <laughs> and we move on uh, to the next speaker. So Joe Carlson has the floor. Okay. So can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay. It's thank not full. Very... Maybe it can be enlarged a little bit or... Oh, uh, yeah, I guess I don't know how to do that. No, it, it, it's, it's good enough. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to this meeting. As everyone, I'm sure, we wish we were there in person. It's a beautiful place. I've had many great experiences at meetings there. Hopefully soon again. So I'm going to talk about uh, structure and response, different kinds of responses than were discussed previously in nuclear and cold atom physics and try to make some brief comparisons. So there's many people who have contributed to this work, including a couple of the organizers here and many other colleagues around the country and the world. I'm going to start by briefly reminding you about the equation of state and pairing in the unitary Fermi gas and neutron matter, some of the comparisons that were done there, both in bulk and finite systems, of course, experimentally in nuclear physics, nuclear are finite systems, so except for neutron stars, we're dealing with finite systems. And then I'm going to spend the bulk of the time talking about electron and neutrino scattering from nuclei, why that's interesting and potentially important, and try to make some comparisons to spin and density response in cold fermion. And finally, at the end, I'll talk a little bit about prospects for calculating not just response functions, but explicit final states in these reactions. So just to remind you, there's a well-known similarity between cold fermions in the unitary regime and low density neutron matter. On the upper left here is a plot of the zero temperature equation of state of neutron matter plotted as the ratio to the Fermi gas energy as a function of Kf on the upper axis or Kfa on the bottom axis. And of course the unitary regime in cold atoms is that Kfa equals infinity. And there the energy over the Fermi gas is both experimentally and theoretically 0.37. So we're kind of close to that regime. The energy over the Fermi gas energy in this very low density regime is roughly a half. And those are just a couple of different uh, simplified nuclear interactions. And all, all the S wave is the dominant component down there. Then there are also calculations of the pairing gap. Those have also been done in both neutron matter and cold atoms. Uh, we find in neutron matter that the pairing gap is a fraction, a half or a little bit more of the BCS pairing gap and similar results are found in cold atoms. There you can go from the weak coupling or BCS regime to the strong coupling regime and see a nice transition basically between fermions superfluid paired fermions and bosons. We can also calculate things like the quasi-particle spectrum in neutron matter. Uh, if you 
excite a nucleon or flip a spin of a cold atom? Uh, what is the dispersion relation as a function of the momentum of that extra particle? And in cold atoms at unitary, it actually peaked is minimum a little bit below the Fermi surface, but in neutron matter to the resolution we can tell in our simulations, it's at the Fermi surface and we can get the effect of mass and so forth. And then finally on the bottom right, a little more important for what I'm gonna discuss the rest of the talk, is the momentum distributions in neutron matter. This is of course related to the, in cold atoms to the contact, the probability of an up and a down spin being on top of each other. And here's a plot as a function of KFA. So KFA of minus one is comparatively weak coupling and KFA equals minus 10 is getting close to the unitary regime. And you can see by them, there's a large component uh, of the momentum distribution beyond the Fermi momentum. And for the cold atoms, you know, analytically, the behavior of this is just the amplitude that you have to calculate, which is essentially the contact. So as a theorist, I'm allowed to say, well, if I could make any kind of experiment in cold atom physics, any number of particles, whatever, uh, what would I find interesting? Uh, there's a lot of things we've looked at in finite systems and trying to relate cold atom systems to neutron matter in particular, which of course we have very few experimental constraints on neutron matter, starting to get more on neutron stars, but that's typically high density. So one thing we can just put particles in a harmonic oscillator on the upper left, I just show if you have free fermions, you get a very strong shell structure plot the energy over the Thomas Fermi energy, the Thomas Fermi energy is just a constant times h bar omega times n to the four thirds. n is energy per particle and n to the one third is you gradually filling up the shells um, and you would get in the n goes to infinity limit, you, this would go to one. And you can see how it approaches one for the free Fermi gas on the bottom left, if you put neutrons in Armat oscillator potential, it looks somewhat similar, but the shell structure is much weaker because you have the superfluid pairing. And you can put it in different strengths of harmonic oscillators and you get different behavior. You can also look at odd even staggering, which is re related to superfluidity. You can look at spin orbit splittings and so forth. On the bottom right is the unitary Fermi gas and harmonic oscillator potential. Uh, I won't go through all the plots, but you can see just this is plotted as energy over the Thomas Fermi energy squared, which will go to 0.37 if you have an infinite uh, gas. And you can see it's very different than the harmonic oscillator potential results for free fermions and for neutrons. And in fact, it looks essentially totally smooth, you've lost the shell structure completely. So what another kind of thing we'd like to look, be able to address is that in the difference between uh, bulk properties and finite systems, if we could do experiments on any number of uh, cold atoms, it would be nice to look at the transition between the kind of pairing we have in nuclei and the kind of pairing that we have in the unitary Fermi gas uh, for larger particle number. And typically in nuclei, we think pairing is at the Fermi surface. The pairing just involves one or two states around the Fermi surface and the coupling of states with different angular momentum uh, to get total angular momentum zero. But in the unitary Fermi gas, the pairing is in the bulk. In, the, in fact, in the center, the coherence length, is, where the density is high, the coherence length is very small. And as you move out, the coherence length gets longer. So this brings up, we'd love to do these experiments. This seems to be very difficult, but these are all structure. What about the dynamics? And it's kind of the easiest dynamics to address is linear response. And I'm gonna talk more or less about linear response at high energy and momenta in, in the degrees of freedom that we're looking at. So we're basically looking at nucleons 
we like to look at what's called quasi-elastic scattering, where you give a momentum to a nucleon of order the Fermi momentum and look at the behavior of that. It's interesting for many body physics regions, uh, reasons. There's a lot of experiments at Jefferson Lab addressing that, but it's also interesting for fundamental physics regions. And in particular, there are a lot of huge experimental programs on neutrino scattering from nuclei. In the US, the future effort is focused on Dune, which is an experiment uh, where they produce neutrinos at Fermilab and then measure them in Dakota. And the goal is to look for oscillations. And in particular, they want to look at the CP violating phase in the neutrino sector. So this is a very, it requires a very sensitive, it requires more accuracy in the neutrino nucleus cross section than you require, for example, to get the mass differences or the oscillation parameters, which have already been measured to a certain accuracy. Uh, T2K has also embarked on these kind of experiments. They're looking at things like CP violating phase eventually, but also the mass hierarchy, whether the electron neutrinos are lighter than the mu and tau or heavier. And this requires their interaction through matter. So you need these longer baseline experiments like T2K and Dune for that. This, the reason this is non-trivial is the beams of neutrinos are not like electron beams. They're spread out a lot in energy. On the upper curve there, it shows a bunch of different experiments and their spectrum of neutrinos from one to a few GeV. On the bottom left and right are the spectrum of neutrinos in Dune and T2K in the hashed region and the different curves are, are signals that you would observe from the CP, different CP violating phases. And you can see there's a signal around the 1 GeV region, which is basically quasi elastic scattering. There's also a signal on the 2 to 4 GeV region, which is the hadronic region where you excite deltas, et cetera. That's a more complicated reason, region to analyze physically. In electron scattering, there's been a lot of experiments recently looking at response, but also in particular at exclusive final states and how many times you see in a neutron and a proton coming out from what was initially a back-to-back -back configuration in momentum space. So two nucleons close together in coordinate space will have a high relative momentum and they can compare how many times they see a neutron-proton pair versus a proton-proton pair, essentially. The response, inclusive response is a sim simpler cat, uh, observable to calculate, as I'll try to show you. Uh, the cross-section, of course, for electron neutrino scattering has been studied for a very long time. It has two components, a longitudinal response and a transverse response, which essentially the charge and current scattering. And depending on how you set up your experiment and the kinematics, uh, the, the angle and the momentum transfer and energy transfer you look at, you always get a linear combination. But by taking several measurements, you can extract the two components of the response and therefore get the total cross-section. We're going to look, as I said, at momentum transfers of order kf or higher, and the energies are higher, the order, the Fermi energy are higher. This is much simpler to calculate in a many body context than the uh, general response at all energies and momentum. In electron scattering, it's simple. As I said, there are two response functions in neutrino, anti neutrino scattering. It's more complicated. You have an axial current, and in general, there are five total response functions that come in there. So the simplest picture at these highest energy and momenta is you just take quasi-elastic scattering and uh, plane wave impulse approximation. So you assume that the scattering from the nucleons is incoherent. They don't interfere with each other. And you sum over the response to each nucleon and each nucleon you describe by its form factor, either longitudinal transverse form factor, and its momentum distribution that you've calculated in the nucleus. 
If you want to be more sophisticated, you can calculate a spectral function, which is the, has the energy dependence of removing a nucleon of a certain momentum as well. So if you integrate over omega as uh, the spectral function, you'll get the momentum distribution. There are two things that have been observed in electron scattering that are important to remember and relevant for neutrino scattering. One is there, for a long time, it's been observed that there's a scaling with momentum transfer. If you do a non-relativistic quantum system and go to high momentum transfer, you expect to have a scaling, this incoherent scaling, uh, incoherent scattering off the different nucleons and you'll get something called Y scaling. Y is just basically a unit of energy displaced from the quasi-elastic peak, which is at zero here. And the bottom left is a experimental picture over different kinematic regions of Y. And you can see different nuclear, uh, different final states and different uh, kinematics and you can see that you're basically just depending only on this variable y scaling. I caution you that this is a logarithmic plot, so that you know the, fa the factors of fifty percent don't necessarily show up too clearly in such a logarithmic plot. But you, the basic picture is scattering off of individual nucleons. And the other thing that's noticed in scattering from electrons from nuclei is called superscaling. If you keep the kinematics the same, the response looks identical nearly for different nuclei at large momentum transfer. Of course, at low momentum transfer, it depends on the size of the nucleus, et cetera. But for high momentum transfer, it, this is now a linear plot. And you can see for nuclei from carbon uh, to lead, you get essentially the same response function as a, again, as a function of this variable psi prime, which is a scaling variable, which is essentially the momentum energy and momentum transfer to the nucleus zero is the top of the quasi-elastic peak. On the right-hand side, of course, there's this is totally broken. You can produce deltas, and that will depend on the, and you can produce pions, and that will depend on the kinematics and the nucleus, as you see. But we'll concentrate on the quasi-elastic regime. And the, the thing that you can calculate easily in a many body system is just the momentum distribution. This is works of Diego Lanardoni, Bob Uringa, and company. This is helium four on the top, uh, carbon 12 in the red, and oxygen on six, 16. And you can see the momentum distributions are similar. The Fermi momentum of nuclei is about 1.3 inverse Fermi. So there's a big peak beyond the uh, big uh, region beyond the Fermi momentum. You can also calculate two body momentum distributions. These happen to be NP pairs in blue and PP pair or NN pairs in red for, for different, uh, for helium four as a function of the relative momentum for a total momentum of zero. Experimentally, the recent experiments focus on these back-to-back -back nucleons, and they see this significant enhancement of NP pairs versus PP pairs. And again, this is work of Bob Ringa and Diego Lonardoni, who's done this in chiral interactions. And it's independent of the nucleus, of course. It depends on the short-range physics of uh, associated with one or two Internucleon separations, which is basically the same range as the pion interactions in nuclear physics. However, it's not exactly so simple. If you break it down further and don't just look at the cross section, but you look at the two for an electron scattering, the two different components of the uh, response, the two responses, transverse and longitudinal and you divide out the nucleon form factors and the charges or magnetic moments squared, you get these two curves for carbon 12. And this is for different momentum transfer. You can see that the transverse response is enhanced by about 50% compared to the longitudinal response. The longitudinal is basically just scattering off the protons. 
and there's no big two body corrections to the currents there. The transverse does have a big contribution from part two body currents, in particular pion exchange currents, and that gives you this enhancement of about 50%. So if you look at the different momentum transfers from 0.3 to 1 GeV over C, you can see that you're sensitive to internucleon separations of half a Fermi to two Fermi. So that's basically uh, of order of the internucleon separation in the nucleus. So that, that is the reason you can treat these systems as scattering off of one or more accurately uh, pairs of nucleons. The response functions, of course, as in any system, linear response, you just calculate it as a current current correlation function. If you write it out in the space of final states, you get the sum over final states a given momentum transfer and a delta function in energy conservation. Uh, longitudinal is basically just the, new, the protons, as I said. In the transverse, the dominant component is the magnetic component, scattering off the magnetic moment. But there are two body currents associated with pion exchange, which are significant. Uh, for a long time now, we calculated Euclidean response. We can do this in imaginary time and basically go from a sum rule, which doesn't have any dynamic information, to some information on the dynamics by basically calculating the transform of the response function, the Laplace transform. And basically, you do this with a path integral as the particles um, evolve in the system, the propagator e to the minus h tau for the free particles is basically a Gaussian, which gives like q squared over 2m. That is that uh, for a q of order kf or larger, that basically results in a nearly local operator. So this whole thing in the brackets, j dagger e to the minus h tau j is only has uh, non-localities of order one or two particle separation. So that shows that you have a local operator. And since all nuclei have the same density, that's why you get this superscaling behavior. It does not necessarily imply purely incoherent scattering, though, because you can have, uh, in, in the case of the transverse response, you do have uh, scattering over, across from pairs of nuclei. Uh, which makes some significant contribution. Joe, a quick reminder, you have about four minutes left. OK. So I'll just say that electron scattering, this is work of Alessandro Lovato and collaborators. It works very well in electron scattering. Uh, this is a, at a different higher momentum transfer in the transverse response. This is the two body contribution is the difference between the red and the black curve, which is describing the data very well. Recently, Alessandro and collaborators have put out um, comparisons with neutrino scattering, both from Mini Boon and T2K. The data is more, uh, has much larger uncertainties here. And the overall agreement, particularly with mini boon, is pretty good. G2K is higher, kin higher energy kinematics, so relativistic effects are likely to play more of a role. But ba the basic agreement is significant, and it does require this enhancement of the two body response. So I wanted to just compare this for things that have been seen in spin and density response in cold atoms. Uh, there are various experiments on the upper right is the spin response uh, of a strongly interacting Fermi gas. And you can see those are peaked again at this quasi-elastic kinematics, which is one on the horizontal scale. The spin response though at unitarity, which is on the upper left, is basically has two peaks, one associated with the scattering off the pairs and the two body state. So in this case, the two body component is more significant than it would be in nuclear physics because you have unitarity and you have a zero range interaction. There's also, of course, measurements of spectral response and the contact. That, that is another uh, kind of response that you can measure. And it tells you a lot about the contact, which people have tried to make analogies 
between nuclear physics and cold atom physics. And there's a lot of physics you can get out of that, uh, but it is a different system. It's not so clean in nuclear physics, it's more complicated. So a question I wanna have as I start to wrap up is can we mimic or test models of nuclear and cold atom response? It would be nice if we could look at things that y, like Y scaling and super scaling in cold atoms. Obviously there'll be differences with nuclear physics. Can we look at uh, short time approximation and the importance of both short range correlations and two body dynamics in the quasi elastic regime and get, to get a microscopic understanding of the context that people extract from nuclear physics experiments. Of course, if you go to low energy, you can start to look at superfluidity and et cetera. I won't have time to go over this uh, short time approximation, but basically if you wanna get real dynamics, there's only a limited amount you can do with regular computers. This is work of sorry, Pastroy and collaborators. If you take basically uh, two body propagation and put in two body final states instead of just the one body plane waves, you can get more physics out than you can get uh, from just plane wave impulse approximation. In particular, you can get this enhancement from the two body currents. And what that tells you, basically, since you have two body dynamics, you get out something basically uh, response density, which depends on the total energy or the energy of the center mass of the pair and the relative energy and integrating that over surfaces of constant total uh, local plus relative energy gives you the response, which again, agrees well with experiments. And finally, I just wanna mention the, the way that we could really do a lot more, hopefully in the near future is to look at quantum computers because then you're not limited to one or two steps of a real-time response, but you can, in principle, just calculate directly this J dagger, E to the I H T J in the ground state or in a thermal ensemble as appropriate. And we've been exploring that in particular, Alessandro Ruggiero uh, and collaborators have done a lot with this. The, at, at the present, the hardware is quite limiting, but hopefully that, will uh, rapidly advance and we can get a lot of physics out, out of this. For neutrinos, in particular, what's important is that they picked argon as a target because they can see tracks of charged particles. So they can look at explicit final states where you have a proton going out at a certain momentum and so forth. And that's much more difficult than the inclusive response. Also the to get corrections to this, uh, NP versus PP uh, explicit final states seen in electron scattering, you'd like to do a better job of including the final states, which has not really been done to date. So I just mentioned some future directions. It, it would be nice to have a whole lot more data, particularly in the cold atoms, to compare theories of nuclear matter and cold atom response in the quasi-elastic regime and beyond. I didn't really have time to address it, but in the neutrino experiments, in addition to this quantum treatment of the response at the vertex, they append uh, classical, semi-classical treatments of final state interactions. And can we test that with cold atoms and or quantum computers? There's basically, uh, you're assuming there's no interference beyond a certain point. Seems a reasonable approximation, but exactly how that breaks down and where it works well would be nice to address. And we like to test that both in nuclear physics and finite cold atom systems. Of course, there are many other bulk responses. Spin susceptibility is very important in neutron stars and viscosity, as was mentioned previously. And of course, if you have uh, these systems, you can go much beyond linear response and address quantum dynamics more completely, which is a, a very uh, encompassing, very uh, lo perhaps long-term, but very exciting goal. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Joe.
Um, we have time for a couple of questions. So while people muster the courage, maybe I can ask, um, from a practical perspective, are you thinking of doing the full dynamics on a quantum computer uh, first for a cold atomic system, like for a simpler interaction? Well, and yeah, in effect, what we've done to date is uh, basically, you know, pineless, so contact interaction. So it's kind of like that. And, you can, you can do and, and do you, do, does it really matter or is it just like a practical question of implementation, like in terms of scaling, et cetera? Do you care? Well, it, you know, if you have, let's say you decide to put this on a lattice for simplicity, then as you, uh, the contact interaction is the easiest, you know, it's extreme, of course, extremely local, but you can put in pions, it's like, you know, nearest neighbor, next nearest neighbor, maybe a few more lattice sites. And I think the major problem is just getting the hardware and well, the number of qubits and particularly the error rate down so that we can uh, address a size of a nucleus, even helium four would be interesting. Uh, so I, you know, I think once we can do it for cold atoms, it won't be very long before we can do it for nuclei. Okay, great, thanks. Any other questions for Joe? Yes, Mark, please. Um, so I, I just wanted to ask uh, if there's any prospect for seeing um, like Larkinov Chinnikov type phases, you know, where, the, where you get a non-spatially uniform condensate breaks translational invariance. Yeah, I, I don't know that I've totally kept up with that. That was always, you know, close to being true at unitarity in the, or near unitarity in the unitary Fermi gas. However, the transition temperature that you'd expect was always very low. So I, I can't really comment on the process. I don't really know the answer to that. What is okay, that? thanks. There have been a lot uh, of could... adva advances in, for example, making traps which are flat so they have constant density systems. So I think there is much more hope, but still you need to get the temperature very low. Yeah, I, I could pitch in just quickly. Uh, th there are some experiments that were done by Hewlett's group uh, on Rice University. Uh, and of course, uh, you expect the FF or LO phases mostly uh, at the sort of a quasi one dimensional system, it, it, the chances of observing are there. I think they got very close uh, but, uh, to observing this. And I, you know, although the, I think they claim that they have observed, but the issues again, the, uh, even in those in the situations, the temperatures uh, are, are sufficiently low that there's some degree of uncertainty if they really reach that regime or not. But I mean, if you, you, you wanna check uh, Randy Hewlett's work um, on lithium, in, in the quasi one dimensional configuration. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, let's uh, thank uh, Joe once again, and we move on to the third speaker of this session. So Pai Vitorma has the floor. Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. So I, I will uh, open up my talk and share the screen. Okay, uh, it's saying you cannot start a screen share while the other participant is sharing. Joe, have you stopped sharing screen? Yes, I believe I have. Might maybe try it again. Okay, I, I will try now again. Yeah, now it works. Yes. Yes, good. So, yeah. Yes, so I, I have 25 minutes, right? Yes, and I will give you a warning 20 minutes into it. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you. So 
Thank you very much uh, for this uh, invitation. And uh, I, of course, would like to be in Trento, but uh, we have to live with this. So uh, I will uh, now talk about quite different topics as, uh, as the previous uh, speakers, but I hope there will be some uh, connections and uh, general interest. So uh, uh, I, I talk about quantum geometry and in three different uh, contexts, superconductivity, and then Bose-Einstein condensation of bosons, and finally light matter interactions, with the same kind of quantum uh, geometry and topology concepts come up uh, in all of them. And uh, I start with superconductivity because this is uh, interestingly related to uh, questions like, can we have ever room temperature superconductivity? And uh, now some of you know superconductivity very well, so, so there will be almost trivial things to start with, but I um, start like this because maybe some others have worked on completely different topics and need to be reminded from, of some textbook physics. So we start with quantum geometry and superconductivity. And uh, as you know, superconductivity is an extremely useful thing used to create uh, huge magnets and also uh, building blocks of quantum computers and so on. This all requires cooling and that makes it very inefficient. So why don't we have actually room temperature superconductors yet? And um, the first thought is that it's really strange because it's just about factor of two from the um, normal high TC superconductors room temperature. And by the way, I'm not here uh, talking about the high pressure superconductors. That's another story. But in ambient pressure, why can't we have it? Why can a factor of two be a problem? Well, this is uh, then easy to see if you uh, remind about the basics of uh, superconductivity. So namely that um, spin up and down electrons in a solid make uh, Cooper pairs. And uh, then it's known that even a weak interaction, as is typical uh, in materials, can make these pairs. But somehow these phenomena have to compete with the large uh, kinetic energy. There are a lot of uh, fermions there. And uh, according to the BCS theory, uh, the critical temperature is exponentially suppressed. So, OK, there is something exponential now, which uh, makes it understandable that even factor of two is difficult. So this u is the interaction, and n would be the density of states. OK, but there is this uh, competition. So why don't we just remove the kinetic energy? So then everything can, will come from interactions, and maybe we get higher critical temperatures. And this actually. Uh, it's true, you can get these group pairs easier uh, if you just have a flat band. And here are some basic concepts again. And the usual band in a solid is described by the block phase function, and uh, the band can have some kind of bandwidth. And then if your band is so flat that the interactions start to be bigger than bandwidth, you can say that you have essentially flat band. It can be also kind of uh, uh, exactly flat. This person is constant or almost constant, and zero group pairs, obviously. So in this kind of band, it has been shown by mean field studies that the pairing critical temperature is actually linearly uh, pro uh, proportional to the interaction. And therefore, for small interactions, it's kind of exponentially better than the BCS theory. So this could be a route uh, to room temperature superconduct. But there are some, some problems on the way. This V is, by the way, the volume of the flat band in real one, so sense. But uh, before going to the problems, I, I will uh, highlight here what kind of flat bands we are interested. So of course, you can make the dispersion flat also in the atomic limit that you bind the atoms or electrons close to the atoms. They don't move anywhere, but that's uninteresting. The interesting case uh, is a flat band that comes, for instance, from geometry or from magnetic fields like Landau levels. So here, the Liebler, this is a nice example of uh, this kind of geometry uh, caused flat band. 
it has this kind of structure. So you can think that you uh, have a wave function which has plus amplitude here and minus amplitude on the B side. And now if there is tunneling from a, a C to A and B to A, they will cancel. So therefore things cannot uh, propagate in this lattice if they are in this state. So uh, it's fully localized due to destructive interference. And this makes a flat band in the leaf lattice structure. So these ones, these kind of things are actually interesting. So now let's come to the problem. Uh, not only we need Cooper pairs, but also supercurrent. So you need to have a Meissner effect and dissipationless current and so on. And whether that exists is uh, determined by so-called superfluid uh, density or superfluid weight, which is um, determining that if the Cooper pairs have momentum Q, then the current is distant. In BCS theory, it's essentially given by the particle density. So, so the Cooper bears that are condensed uh, divided by effective mass, and this contribution is small. And the effective mass is, of course, a derivative of the dispersion. And here is the problem this is zero in a flat band. So, the first thought is that, okay, nice, you have a flat band so that the pairing uh, critical temperature is very high, but then you don't have superfluid, they don't move. Well, this actually is not the full story. And uh, me and, and several co-workers, we have found out relatively recently that if you do a full multiband analysis, the superfluid weight is not just determined by the um, dispersion, but there are some geometric and uh, topological quantities coming into play. So I will very briefly uh, summarize the contents of these papers here. And uh, the approach that we used was a mean field BCS theory. Uh, these are the fermions that uh, can hop. This is hopping matrix element from one lattice side to another. Alpha and beta are orbital indices. So this is a system with many orbitals per unit cell and consequently many bands like here. And then they interact this uh, is an attractive interaction, and uh, they, this can be solved to uh, give order parameter of superconductivity like this. And, and then uh, we describe supercurrent by assigning a momentum to this order parameter. Then to calculate this superfluid density uh, concept, that is really the one that determines whether you can have superfluidity or not, you can use several approaches. Uh, it can be, for instance, if you apply a vector potential and see what is the current, it's the kernel that gives it. Or you can calculate it from the current potential when you apply um, this equivalent momentum. This is maybe intuitive because you can think that you, you plug in the supercurrent and then you see whether the energy raises or lowers. And if it raises, it's fine. Then the system is stable against this current. So we have used both of these and not only us, also others have been repeating this calculation since then. And the basic result is like this. So there is a, a contribution, which we call the conventional one because it's the one that was known before. So second derivative of the dispersion, but there is a new contribution, the geometric one that comes only in multiband lattices and this one can be non-zero also in a flat band. So there is something that makes it possible to have superfluidity, even if the band is completely strict, uh, strictly flat. And uh, interestingly, this part is proportional. First of all, it's linearly proportional uh, to interaction, exactly the same way as the pairing temperature. And it's proportional to a concept called quantum metric. So here we get the geometric contribution. The superfluid weight becomes proportional to quantum metric. And what is that? Um, that was defined by, uh, I mean, early on, by uh, trying to uh, define a metric uh, for distances uh, in, in a Hilbert space. So here you have some um, uh, wave functions of a Hilbert space. You, you could think about this, for instance, a block states of a band. 
and you vary some parameter, maybe momentum, and you see how far from each other the states are. So you get some kind of metric from there, and then a gauge invariant version was introduced, and it turned out that this metric is a part of a bigger tensor, which is called quantum geometric tensor, and looks like this. And uh, its real part is the quantum metric, and imaginary part is the Berry curvature. So here, this quantum metric is connected to topology by, via this um, geometric tensor. Because it has some properties, it's positive, semi definite, and so on. And yeah, you might have learned about it under different names. So using uh, this quantum geometric tensor, we were able to derive a fundamental relation between uh, the topological properties of a band and the superfluid density in a flat band. So whenever there is some non-zero Berry curvature in the system or uh, a finite share number, you, uh, you can have superfluidity in a flat band. So see, this turn number could be zero, if you still have finite Berry curvature or quantum metric, you can have this superfluid density. But you know that in the other way around, if a uh, turn number is non zero, then it's guaranteed that you have superfluidity. And uh, that uh, was a mean field result, but this has been uh, since then uh, confirmed in various systems, also by uh, numerical methods and also not only by our group but others, so this is a fully established in theory. Direct measurements are still missing. And, and, and now some uh, intuitive uh, understanding what, wh why is it so, and why is there this connection to quantum geometry? Um, could be, this could be understood in the uh, following way. So if you have a single band and uh, and it's flat. This means that the particles are very well localized and that there is almost no overlap between the one-year functions and transport is zero. Then if you put the particles to interact, the transport is still zero. Now in this kind of multiband system that I saw, for instance, the leaf lattice, uh, you can have a flat band, but actually overlapping one-year functions because uh, the movement is uh, prevented by interference, not by the one-year functions being localized. And then if you introduce interactions, these uh, phases that uh, give you the interference are gone and you can actually propagate because there is overlap. And this then uh, is connected to quantum geometry in the following way that it's known uh, from literature that if you have a finite uh, term number, then you cannot have exponentially localized one-year functions. So this, to this localization of one-year functions is connected with the geometric and topological properties. Okay, so this was uh, in uh, 2015 when we started this uh, some kind of um, exotic um, theory, theory interest thing. But uh, then came this twisted bilayer graphene uh, superconductivity and, and this is, of course, really interesting because it's a superconductivity that happens close to quite flat bands. So I will uh, now present a, a research that we did specifically for that uh, system. And uh, if you don't want to know more, there is a uh, kind of news article named like this geometry desk superconductivity, you can just Google that and it's very nice reading. Not written by me, somebody else. Yeah. Okay, but uh, as a background, um, I'm sure you have all heard about these observations that were done in uh, 2018 uh, in MIT and have since then really exploded and created the field. So, uh, yeah, it's animation doesn't work, but, um, so there, they have uh, two graphene sheets and they put them on top of each other with a tiny tilt. Uh, and then you can think that the hexagonal patterns of the graphene, when you have this uh, tiny tilt, you will actually have much longer uh, wavelength patterns, these kind of Moyer patterns, say. 
And they, depending on the tilt angle, the uh, Dirac cones of these original uh, graphene seeds, they merge. And here you see how they, at certain angle, they make an almost flat bands, four almost flat bands at the Fermi level. And there, uh, the experimentalists have seen for instance, superconductivity and also some other uh, correlated states, depending on filling they see either one. So now the question was that has this geometric contribution something to do with the fact that they can see uh, superconductivity in these almost flat bands. And it was not only us that uh, were interested. We were, of course, building uh, based on our own theory, but other people had picked up our theory results and three papers uh, uh, claiming that indeed this uh, twisted bilayer graphene has something to do with this geometric part. They came out uh, more or less at the same time. And uh, what we did there is we did again BCS theory, but now we had a bit. Uh, a more extended uh, pairing scheme. So we also considered the usual uh, uh, on-site interaction as wave pairing. But then we also uh, considered this kind of um, veil resonance valence type uh, pairing. So pairing between neighbors. This could ha happen also for uh, repulsive interactions. And we compared this. Otherwise, it was this multiband uh, BCS theory, but it was actually hugely different because, uh, as you see in these Moir patterns, in the unit cell, you will have a huge number of sites. So, something like 12,000, for instance. So, so even uh, a mean field theory is in almost nearly impossible to do uh, for. Uh, 12,000 bands. So we used some trick, some renormalization thing to get to only 600 bands. And then we did it. I, I, as a context, I have to say here that most uh, theorists that say, ah, let's forget about all the bands and let's just look at the four that are in the middle. They do four band theory. But we had at least about 600. And then we calculated this conventional and geometric parts of the superfluid weight. And uh, we determined that, of course, there is a Tauler's temperature, which you can do if you know the superfluid weight, because this is supposed to set the critical temperature so for superconductivity. And uh, here are results for the two pairing schemes that we use the RVB and the S wave. And this axis you, you should understand mostly as the strength of interaction, which is not known in the uh, uh, system, so we don't really know where we are here, but uh, the estimated experiments are somewhere around this two. So then this pink area is the uh, conventional contribution and this blue is the geometric one. So we can show that uh, most probably this geometric contribution already plays a role in this system. So if you want to quantitatively understand it, you, you have to take it into account. Okay, so uh, yeah, so how would uh, one really prove that the geometric contribution is there is that if you can uh, tune the interaction, then you will see that everything scales with uh, interaction, the critical temperature, the superfluid density, whatever you want, it's linear in interaction strength. But of course, it's very hard to uh, tune interaction in this type of materials. So there we thought that uh, ultra gold gases would be quite interesting because the great point about that is that yes, you can indeed uh, tune the interaction between particles from negative to positive and very accurately, very over huge range is fantastic. So uh, we proposed, um, together with a group of uh, Tillman Esslinger, uh, this kind of experiment. So in Esslinger's group, they have Fermi gases, uh, which are in the form of a transport or two terminal setup. So here they have big cloud of fermions, let's say up and down, and they can uh, form a superfluid. 
and here also, and here is a very tight optical potential, so it's like a um, conduction channel, and they can make little lattices in it. Not this form yet, but other lattices. So we thought that, okay, if they could make this kind of little uh, short loop ladder, that would be interesting because it has a uh, kind of analogs of flat band states uh, of flat, yeah, because of course this is finite system, it doesn't really have bands, but some of the states are localized in the same way as flat bands are. If you have this minus minus and plus uh, amplitude, this don't tunnel anywhere. So you have localized state. In addition, you have, yes? Interrupt. A quick reminder, four or five minutes left. Yeah, okay. Yes, and then you have edge states and also dispersive band states. And here you can see what is the current through in without interactions, we don't see any current. And then with interactions, we see a big current at the flat band. So this is the flat band ended. So this could be a system to test this concept. Okay, so uh, then I have two topics, but this was just few few slides. So uh, I think I will manage. So uh, we wanted to look at bosons in a flat band. What comes up there? So these are just bosonic particles that make a condensate. And in the Kagome lattice, we can create two situations that the flat band is lowest and the uh, uh, BEC forms there, or this person band is lowest and it forms there. And we saw really a dramatic difference. So in a usual dispersive band, it's known that speed of sound is proportional to the density and square root of interaction. And now we found that in the flat band, it's actually proportional to the quantum metric again and linearly to interaction. So quantum geometry tells you what is the speed of sound. And it also determines whether the BC is stable or not, because you can think that uh, in a BC, you usually have this, um, if you have interactions, this quantum depletion, so some interactions because of excitations. And in a flat band, you might think that it immediately fragments all over because there is no energy cost for the, inter, uh, for the excitations. But this is actually not the case. It turns out that the excitation fraction uh, is determined by the quantum distance between the states. So even if interactions try to push condensate to excitations, you cannot form all excitations because there are no wave function overlaps. So quantum geometry actually forces the excitation fraction to be finite. And this is true even uh, at um, vanishing interactions. So this will be, will be an excellent system for studying quantum fluctuations and interaction effects even at a low interaction strength. And finally, we have found that quantum geometry also plays a role in light matter coupling. And here by light matter coupling, you should think about electrons in a solid and light coupling to them. Uh, and, and this is how it's usually derived. You introduce a ve vector potential, they do perturbation theory. And the basic message of this work uh, was that um, if we uh, shine light to a, um, a flat band, then according to the known theory, uh, it, uh, it should not couple because it's often the coupling is proportional to the uh, dispersion and dispersion is uh, trivial here. But if we consider these geometric parts again, we do have finite. Coupling. So here are our results for the inter and intraband, quadratic and linear light matter coupling. And all these terms are geometric terms related to Berry curvature and quantum metric. And I think I will not have time uh, to go through this, but uh, the message here then was that one can use this fact to um, do Floquet engineering, mean, meaning uh, you excite the system with light and you can open topological gaps. And this uh, actually uh, explains an experiment where this gap was observed and it was much uh, bigger than uh, the usual theory would say, but this uh, geometry contribution explains. So uh, that's all. So I have shown that uh, quantum geometry governs many things. 
blood band superfluidity and superconductivity and uh, excitation spectrum in a BEC and also light matter interactions in uh, materials. And uh, this uh, hopefully provides a guidance towards room temperature superconductivity, for instance. And um, yeah, I, I would also like to uh, look more into these uh, photonic systems and quantum geometry. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Pai, for a wonderful talk. Uh, there was already uh, one question. I think Marcello Dal Monte has a question. Yes, uh, Pai, I have a question about uh, the the proposal with Tillman's experiment. Yeah. Uh, I, I did not fully understand. Do you need to have two different phases of the superconductor on the left and on the right of the wire, or you can do it with the, uh, the effect that you mentioned, you can see it for arbitrary phases? Yeah, so... Um, uh, yeah. Here you could have uh, just the usual superfluid here and usual superfluid here. What we have actually uh, calculated here is the Josephson current. So, so if they could make a, a Josephson uh, uh, experiment, like putting in current and seeing critical current, then it would be fine. Uh -huh. So, but I, I know that for them it's difficult to do this. What they usually do is a, a non equilibrium situation. So, again, they have two superfluids, but they put a bias and then they see particle current. And we are at the moment ca calculating the non equilibrium case because that's something that they okay. can do easier. But here, as a kind of so first approach, we showed what happens to the Josephson current. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Any other questions for Paivi? Oh, I have a question if nobody else has. Please. Can I, can I go ahead? Yes, oh, yes, wait yes. a little bit. Paivi, I have a question uh, for you. You know, you know, one way always to think about the superfluid uh, density tensor, right, is that it is uh, a response to phase twists. Mm -hmm. right? So, so now we have many, many, many bands, right? So, so, so each, for each one of those bands, there's an associated phase twist. So, so effectively, the superfluid density tensor is not only a tensor in the spatial coordinates, mm. but also a tensor in the band indices. Yeah. So I get a bit confused. Uh, it seems to me that you are projecting. You always talking yeah. about as a scalar. So it seems to me that yeah, you're always, yeah, we always talked about projecting the, it to a single band, right? Yes, yes. We okay. always uh, talk about the uh, superconductivity here in one band. Right. So so, uh, so, 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 if the other bands were actively participating uh, to some extent, the picture would be very different. So, so it seems to me there's a projection that is yeah, made. Yeah, projection, but th this uh, thing is very subtle. Because, uh, yeah, indeed, we th think that the pairing happens within this flat band. So there is a, a gap to the other bands, and the interaction is so, uh, so weak that you don't really uh, create multi band pairing. The pairing right. is in one band. But yeah. still, to get superfluid density finite, you need to consider all bands in your calculus. No, no, that, that, that is clear. I, 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 yeah. It's completely clear. But, but, but what I'm trying to say is that, is that, is that, the other bands at the end of the day are not involved except uh, via some virtual processes yes, to give yes, exactly. the effective yeah. superfluid yeah. density that you need, which you otherwise you would find to be zero. Right? Yeah, so yeah, so yeah. if they were involved, the picture is completely different. Mm, yeah, it is different, but the I mean, this contribution that uh, is here, this geometric one, it would not suddenly vanish. It's there, but there no, 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 but, 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 but coming but, from this passive band. And we have a- uh, No, no, th this would be there, but, but there'll what? be other contributions. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Be a we have calculated this because in, okay. uh, uh, in several cases, we have, for instance, very you, so that it's either, um, you can think that you are in the uh, flat band pairing limit, or you involve the other bands, then the results change a bit. Right. Yeah. So, well, so I just I, I just to clarify in my mind. That's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I noticed so that you were always talking about a scalar. So, yeah, so it, it, 
it has to be projected into that, that particular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this uh, right. no, I just want nice to understand. results here, they are for the projected, but if you don't do the, uh, I mean, if you start to take into account the other bands also, it's not like um, everything suddenly kind of completely disappears. No, it's no, just, no. I, it's just I, a small correction to it and more, more and more you take into account the other ones, like let's say, you crank up the interaction, so basically, then you're pairing all over. Yeah, no, no, but, but, but that, that, that affects dramatically the critical temperature. Uh, uh, Sorry, uh, we can discuss it <clears throat> anyway. We can discuss about that. That, that, that no, affects um, dramatically. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah it, it, it does not, uh, again, it does not work <laughs> like this that okay, uh, that you have very high critical temperature in the flat band, and then if you increase interaction a bit and you go to the next one, it suddenly goes down. It actually, it's like a small addition to this. I, I no, think I this is an agree, excellent but we'll discuss later, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so but uh, the message is that we have checked this numerically and others also, and nothing dramatic happens when you start to uh, take the other bands into account and these enhancements and so on, they don't go uh, away just like this. So in, in the interest of keeping to the schedule, I think this is an excellent topic to bring back uh, the discussion session at the end of the day.